Good evening, Bumblebee folks. I'm Alexa, resident emo girl, and it's always a joy to come and say hello to y'all. So as somebody with ADHD, I don't always super remember everything I learned in high school, unless it super interested me. And trust me when I say, I enjoyed history. So question for you all, what's something you wish you learned while you were in school? Let me know in the comments, and welcome to the top 10 disturbing moments in history not told in textbooks, part two. Number 10, Les Desparecidos, or The Disappeared. In September of 1973, Chile's then president, Salvador Allende, was overthrown in a coup assisted by the US government, and General Augusto Pinochet took control. Now he was a violent leader who wanted to instill fear in anyone who opposed him. Journalists, politicians, celebrities, and anybody else who publicly opposed him kind of were known to um disappear. Some were later found dead in alleyways or ditches throughout Santiago, the capital, while others were just never found. Pinochet frequently used the National Stadium as a secret detention center, where he rounded up those who opposed him and tormented or killed them. For a good reference, around 40,000 people were rounded up during his 17 year regime, and at least 3,200 were killed or disappeared. Yikes! Number 9. Who Killed Sir Harry Oaks? As somebody who grew up visiting one of his former homes, now known as the Museum of Northern History, I knew I could not leave him off my list. Sir Harry earned his fortune in Canada and moved to the Bahamas in the 1930s for tax purposes. He arrived in Kirkland Lake in northeastern Ontario, Canada on June 19th of 1911, and in September of that same year, he registered the transfer of claim T1663, purchased from George Miniker, and established Lake Shore Mine. Now, 20 years later, the gold mine was the most productive in the Western Hemisphere, and it ultimately proved to be the second largest gold mine in the Americas. On the evening of July 8, 1943, while living in the Bahamas, shortly after midnight, Harry had his life brutally ended. He was struck four times behind the left ear with a miner's handpick to disguise the wounds from a silver ice pick, and was then burned all over his body using insecticide, with the flames being concentrated around the eyes. Here's where it gets really weird. His body was then sprinkled with feathers from a mattress. When he was discovered, the feathers were still being gently blown over his body by the bedroom fan. The Bahamas governor, you know, the Duke of Windsor, who had become a close friend of Harry's during the previous three years, took charge of the investigation from the get-go, inviting two American policemen he knew from Miami to take over the case instead of, like, locals. Okay. The two American policemen had forgotten their fingerprint kits in Miami, but hey, conveniently, the local Bahamas police force had fingerprint kits available in Nassau. By the evening on the second day of the investigation, you know, a mere 36 hours after Oak's body was discovered, they had arrested his son-in-law, Count Alfred de Marigny. Now, Count Alfred was on bad terms with Oak's due to his playboy manners and lack of a meaningful career, and the fact that he'd been married twice before Nancy, also that he had not asked Harry's permission to marry Nancy, yikes. Alfred was acquitted in a trial that lasted several weeks, after the detectives were suspected of fabricating evidence against him. The chief piece of evidence was a fingerprint of his, which one of the officers claimed had been found on a Chinese screen in Oak's bedroom where the body had been found. Later it was discovered that the print had been lifted from the water glass that Alfred had used during his questioning by the uh, police captains. So. Who killed Sir Harry Oaks? The theories that have emerged since 1943 have ranged from a killer reappearing from Oaks's uh, Canadian past to a rage-filled secret lover, also perhaps a hitman sent by mobster Meyer Lansky. Let me know in the comments what you think. My money's on the son-in-law, so is my dad's. <laughs> Number 8. The 1871 Chinese Massacre in Los Angeles So on October 24th of 1871, a mob of 500 men raided Chinatown in Los Angeles, killing at least 20 Chinese Americans and stealing an estimated $1.5 million worth of property. These killings were in response to a um, kapu kapu that had taken place the same day that had ended the life of police officer Robert Thompson. The violence caused a commotion, and police began shouting that, uh, and this was a quote from the time, the Chinese were killing white people. So chaos ensued. It was the start of a decade of violence against Asian American communities in the US. It led to the passing of the Chinese Exclusion Act, which prohibited all immigration of Chinese laborers. Not a good time. Number seven, Canadian gaydar. So while Canada as a country legalized gay marriage a whole decade before the United States, we haven't always been the most progressive about it. Back in the 1960s, Canada was actually so paranoid that the government developed what they called a fruit machine. And today was when I learned the origin of the derogatory use of that word. I knew of its use in queer context, but like not the origin. It was developed by a psychology professor with Carleton University, and subjects were made to view um, sexy gay videos, while the device then measured the diameter of the pupils of the eyes, perspiration, and pulse for a supposed erotic response. The machine was employed in the 1950s and 60s during a campaign to eliminate all gay men from the civil service, the RCMP, and the military. Thanks to the nonsense, a substantial number of workers did lose their jobs, believed to be in the 400 person range. Although funding for the project was cut off in the late 1960s, the investigations continued, and the RCMP collected files on 9,000 people who have been investigated. Current Prime Minister Justin Trudeau offered an apology, 
and compensation to those affected back in 2021, something I think was a long overdue. Number six, Project Sunshine. Yeah, there was nothing 1950s and 60s America loved more than dropping big nuclear devices and watching them go. Kaboom. From a bland to nuke Alaska, which could still happen apparently, to actually nuking space, America wasn't shy about seeing some scenery and thinking, I'll put a mushroom cloud there, that would go nice. But in these early days of nuclear weaponry, we still didn't really know the effects these nuclear tests had on the human body. We had estimates on you know, how much radioactive matter produced by tests would kill a person, but the exact effects of fallout on humans and human tissue were basically unknown and unstudied. And what we did know about the levels of nuclear fallout worried scientists at the time. And yet the world continued to test the weapons. Project Sunshine was a series of research studies that began in 1953 to figure out the impact of radioactive fallout on the world's population. The project was initially kept secret and only became known publicly in 1956, commissioned jointly by the United States Atomic Energy Commission and the USAF Project RAND, Sunshine sought to examine the long-term effects of nuclear radiation on the biosphere due to repeated nuclear detonations of increasing yield. With the conclusion from Project Gabriel that radioactive isotope SR90 represented the most serious threat to human health from nuclear fallout. Project Sunshine sought to measure the global dispersion of SR90 by measuring its concentration in the tissues and bones of the dead. Of particular interest was tissue from the young, whose developing bones have the highest propensity to accumulate SR90 and thus the highest susceptibility to radiation damage. It was in this environment that scientists at the Sunshine Conference, ergo the influence on the name, a conference that looked at the long term effect of atomic weapons, argued in favor of sampling strontium followed in humans to determine whether potentially damaging levels of it were present in different populations. In 19 in 1955, there was a meeting of the Atomic Energy Commission, which came up with some of the specifics of the testing and urged researchers to use their own contacts to um, discreetly get a hold of tissue and bone samples without disclosing the nature of the research being conducted, also not getting the permission of the deceased. Dr. Willard Libby said in the transcript of that meeting, which was only released to the public in 1995, that it is a matter of prime importance to get them, and particularly in the young age group. So human samples are of prime importance, and if anybody knows how to do a good job of body snatching, they will really be serving their country. Yep, that's a direct quote. Sunshine recruited a worldwide network of agents to find recently deceased little ones and then take samples and even limbs that were collected without notification or permission. Around 6,000 corpses from 26 bone collection sites around the world were shipped under top secret conditions to the project's headquarters in Chicago and to a satellite research office at Columbia University in New York. In one particularly grim example, a stillborn's legs were removed by researchers in the UK and the mother was told that she couldn't dress the stillborn for the funeral to conceal from her that the legs had been taken for the project. I can't believe I just found out about this for the first time today. Number five, the Armenian Genocide of 1915. Like many events like this throughout history, this one started because of religious disputes. Armenia became part of the Ottoman Empire in the 15th century, and Armenia was primarily a Christian country, which displeased Ottoman leaders and resulted in mistreatment of Christian Armenians, who were often taxed more heavily and given fewer rights. When Armenians began to protest, when Armenians began to, you know, protest, Turkish military officials began killing hundreds of thousands of Armenian people. The massacres began in 1896, but it was in 1914, after the Turks ended the First World War on the side of the Germans, that uh, everything bad began. Military leaders felt that Armenians were traitors, and on April 24th of 1915, they executed hundreds of Armenian leaders, which only led to more violence against the Armenian people, which continued until 1922. For reference, more than one million folks were killed during that amount of time. Bonkers. Number four, the smallpox epidemic you didn't hear about. So smallpox and other diseases had been killing indigenous tribes since the European settlers carried them over in the 17th century, at least a century prior to the devastating outbreak that was in 1775. But what we don't know is that during the late 1770s and early 1780s, indigenous populations were reduced by 50%. There is speculation in recent histories that settlers may have purposely gifted indigenous people with infected blankets as a form of biological warfare, which sadly makes sense and I hate that so much. Number three, the eugenics movements. So emerging in the late 1800s, it was rooted in racism and ableism, uh, justifying discriminatory acts. Eugenic practices included restrictive immigration laws and forced sterilization. The Supreme Court's Buck versus Bell in 1927 upheld the constitutionality of sterilizing those deemed unfit. California's asexualization acts in the 1910s influenced even the evil German dictator's genocidal policies. Like that's how bad this was. Over 70,000 and predominantly working class women of color faced forced sterilization. Puerto Rican women, deemed essential to economic control, endured the notorious La Operacion. Like they even had a name for it. Black women, especially in North Carolina, bore the brunt of non consensual sterilizations, with Fannie Lou Hamer's ordeal symbolizing a systemic issue. Indigenous women also fell victim to this, revealing a grim reality hidden beneath the surface of reproductive rights in America. I just. 
I have no words. Like, as a woman, this is awful to hear about. Number two, a heck of a cover story. In the late 1970s, Howard Hughes, the reclusive billionaire who hadn't been seen in years, was supposedly building this huge prototype ship that was going to vacuum, you know, valuable minerals from the seafloor. By the way, it turns out it was a CIA cover story. An advanced Soviet submarine had sunk in deep Pacific waters, and uh, they and the US government wanted to get it back. The US government spent years and millions of dollars on a top secret ship. It had to remain top secret because the Soviets would do almost anything to prevent a new submarine falling into enemy hands. After both the Soviet government and journalists continued to prod the United States for answers about the ship, they coined the term, we can neither confirm nor deny, to use as their response. Because we all know that phrase. Number one, it's raining what? On March 3rd of 1896, a woman named Mrs. Crouch was making soap on her porch near Olympia Springs, Kentucky, when she saw chunks of meat raining from the sky. Now some folks thought Mrs. Crouch was playing an elaborate hoax, and media from around the country descended on Olympia Springs to investigate her claims. The chunks of meat were reported to be about 2 by 2 inches, with some even larger chunks found at the scene. Well, initial reports said the meat was beef, two men at the scene tasted the meat and said they believed it was either lamb or deer. Very brave. A sample of the meat was tested and the results said it was either tissue from a human or a horse. While we will likely never know exactly what happened, theories have been swirling about what exactly caused the meat shower. The most plausible theory is that the meat came from a flock of vomiting vultures. Vultures are known apparently to upchuck when they feel threatened, and when a vulture sees another one, you know, doing the act, they often do it as well. See, I just upchuck whenever I have to clean the drains. Not a fun time. And that brings us to the end of our time and jeepers. I think it's almost criminal that I didn't learn about almost any of that in high school. If you learned anything from my ramblings today, could you help us out by giving this video a like, subscribing if you aren't already, hit the bell so you don't miss a thing, and I'll see y'all next time I buzz in over here at Bumblebee.